explain to my viewers that I'm now talking to Ari Grace, who has a fantastic uh, YouTube channel all about her, well, it's just about your personal life as, as well as your environmental activism, isn't it? So it's yeah. kind, of a, kind of a mixture of lifestyle and activism. Yeah, it's a really good mix, and I would encourage any uh, if, there, if there are any uh, parents watching with kids um, who might be interested in doing something similar, then I think yours is a good channel, a good example to look to. So, Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I can start by asking you when you first learnt about climate the climate crisis um just like climate stuff in general or yeah i guess yeah sorry that was a bit of a vague <laughs> not very specific but i suppose when did you first realize that or when did you first learn about climate change i guess I mean, obviously, when I was younger, I knew the term global warming, yeah, which I didn't actually understand. Like, I'm sure if someone asked me what it was, I would have said, like, oh, the earth is getting warmer, obviously. Hmm. But I didn't really understand why or if it was like, I knew, like, oh, it's bad, but I didn't understand why it was bad. I just was like, oh, global warming's bad. And yeah. I was kind of, I was kind of a little hippie. I love, like, peace signs and yeah. all of that kind of stuff and tie-dye and so I used to always say I had a little thing I would go oh wait what was it peace love save the whales is what I would do oh, when great. I was in middle yeah. school I was <laughs> no one liked me in middle school it was so like I love little baby Ari she was just crazy but um so I knew I was like oh save the earth whatever but I didn't really understand and then I started seeing things about Greta on Instagram, and so I started looking at her speeches, and I originally wasn't following her because of climate change or anything like about what she was doing. I just was like, wow, she has a really large platform. That's really cool, because mm. originally my thing with activism was um, gun control for oh, really? like a good two minutes that I did that, and then um, I started watching her speeches, and I was, again, only watching because I thought she was just an amazing speaker. Yeah. And I wanted to, I just, it was enthralling. And then I started kind of listening to what she was saying. And I was like, wow, that sounds a little bit concerning. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I started doing more research about climate change, about global warming. And I was like, okay, so we are, this is a problem. Mm. <laughs> and that's uh, when I started this, my school strike. So that was you, last year. Sorry? That was last year. Okay, yeah, and and you started the uh, Fridays for Future Utah, is that right? Yeah, so I thought that I was going to go and strike alone um, because I didn't see or hear anyone up there, but there ended up being a girl named Raquel, who I actually just got off the phone with, who had been up there since May. So last Friday was our one-year anniversary strike. Unfortunately, couldn't go to that because of coronavirus, but um, of her being there. So she was already there for about two months, and then I joined in March, oh, okay. and it was just the two of us, and then I kind of turned us into Fridays for Future Utah. Great. Fantastic. Good job. Um, and you've had different people joining you on, you've had some pe more people on some weeks, see from your videos? Yeah, it's really hit or miss, to be honest. For the first good couple months, it was just me and Raquel which was discouraging. There's one picture that I have of us where mm. it's just two of us that, and I think someone stopped by to say hello and then they took a picture and it was 103 degrees. I believe it was in June. And we, I would be, bring a huge jug from work cause we just throw them all away. So I took some home, washed it out and I would bring it water in it. And it was huge and really heavy. I don't know why I did that. Um, and so I brought it and we drank all of it. And it yeah. was burning hot, like it hurt to drink because it was so hot outside. And then we ran out. And I just remember that day, and we were both too tired and exhausted from heat exhaustion to walk up to the Capitol. So we just sat there being miserable. So uh, for a long time, it was just us. But then people would join. 
guy named Kevin who has been working on environmental things forever. He started joining us. A guy named Vaughn started joining us. Um, and then it was just kind of the four of us. And then in the summertime, it started like more college kids would come. A couple high school kids would come. Yeah. But like I said, it was like super hit or miss, just depended on the week and who felt like showing up. And then once school started, numbers just went down. And then it was just like, and it's, it's usually less than 10 people every week now. But, like, but, but I'm sure it feels like, I mean, when I've done stuff like that, I've, I've not done a weekly climate strike, but I've done similar things in the past. And I think sometimes just the discipline of doing it every week can make you feel really good and, and kind of keeps the passion burning, doesn't it? And yeah. Um, I mean, I know some weeks it, it's probably, you probably get quite depressed and you, you might be thinking where, where is everyone sort of thing. Yeah. But, um, I wrote down a whole load of questions, but I don't know if I'm going to ask them all because I'm realizing now some of them are just a bit boring. So, <laughs> um, like I was going to ask you, do you have like particular websites you go to for, for the science, the climate science or, but. I don't know. Um, and then do you draw links between what's going on with the climate and um, ecological devastation in general? Because I know that I saw a litter pick video you did, which was really cool. Um, do, you, do you kind of draw a lot of links in your mind or do you keep that? Do you keep the, the litter separate from from climate change in your mind or? I keep it separate. Um, I used to not, but I do now because something that really frustrates me <laughs> is metal straws. Yeah. Hear me out. Save the turtles. First of all, metal straws don't really kill turtles. Okay. There was one video of a turtle with a straw in its nose and now you all think it's <laughs> a straw. Turtles. They don't. Fishing nets kill turtles. So yeah. you're wrong. Um, but your heart's in the right place. So it's fine. Yeah. But like, just the misconception of using a metal straw and a reusable water bottle is going to save the planet. Oh, sure. I'm like, that is so much litter that we need to get rid of. And yes, you should be using those reusable things. But it actually, depending on how you look at it, produces more emissions to be using your metal straw. Like, you're going to have to use that metal straw thousands of times before it has the same amount of emissions as your plastic straws do. So it's kind of like, I, I think people's hearts are in the right place. And re using reusables has been promoted by green organizations and truly green people who care yeah. because it is better. You don't want to have that litter, that pollution, that garbage. Mm. But at the same time, I think companies have grabbed onto it as a way of greenwashing. Oh, yeah. And, and kind of said like, okay, use your reusable straw, like save the earth. And I'm like, you're not saving the earth. Exactly. at all in the long run because yeah you're gonna save a couple square miles from having your straws in them mm. but the earth is still warming you're not doing anything to help that and you may even be making it worse a because of if you don't use it consistently then it's just extra emissions you bought for no reason and b because you using your reusable things and saying that you're all green uh, is really just a way of you thinking you're doing something when you're really not and it prevents you from taking further action. And I think that a lot of people in power has, have started to capitalize on that. Oh, yeah. No, I totally, totally agree with you, 150%. Um, so, yeah, another question I was going to ask is, how worried are you for your future? I mean, um, where do you, do, do, do you get really scared about what could happen? So, originally, I wasn't scared. I'm a really logical person. I've been told by a psychiatrist that I have Asperger's and it, it makes sense to me in my life. After hearing, hearing that, I was like, oh, duh. Um, my parents don't believe her, so I guess we'll never know. But um, I'm super logical. And so at first, I remember I went to this conference, the Utah Youth Environmental Summit, and it was really great. It was fun. We stayed in a cabin in the, in the forest and did a bunch of stuff. Um, Sounds great. And they, we had one of the we were sitting around the fire and everyone was talking about the moment that they knew they had to be a climactus. And they were all talking about these moments where they were like, I realized that people in Africa were doing suffering like this, or I saw that these animals were dying or I saw, and they were all these like emotionally charged experiences people had that they were like, I have to fix this. 
Whereas I was like, oh, that sounds like a problem. I looked at the graph. The graph went like this. The graph's not supposed to go like that. Yeah. Great, cool, let's fix that because that's not how the graph's supposed to be. Like, yeah. it was not an emotional thing. It was just like, oh, we're going to make things right because things should be right. And then as it went on, I, well, I also got to see, um, there's a full VR documentary that I can send you the link to after and you can put it down in your description sure. because you can view it online without a VR headset even though it makes it a lot cooler with the VR. And if you have Oculus Rift goggles, you can use those. But Dan Fung Dennis, he's an Academy Award nominee, and he created new technology to make a documentary in full VR called This Is Climate Change. Oh, I don't know and when that. I saw that, I remember, it was right when I, like, not right when I started, but it was less than a year of activism. Like, I was pretty new. I was still a little bit ignorant about things. Um, and the first part of it, you're in Greenland watching the ice melt. And of everything in that documentary, that was what made me want to cry. And I didn't understand why. But I just remember standing there on a glacier and watching massive pieces the size of my house just fall into the water and be gone. And watching like rushing rivers that could like, again, destroy my entire house with their force. My cat wants to come in. Be quiet, please. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I just was like, again, it wasn't an emotional thing like, oh, this is bad. This is hurting people. It was like, that's not supposed to happen. That, that, mm, I don't think that's supposed to happen. And it freaked yeah. me out. Then as time went on, it got more, it didn't get more scary, but I heard more people talking about climate anxiety. And I was like, oh, like, I thought that I understood it. I thought that I got it like, oh, you're scared about the climate. Like, obviously, like, oh, it's scary all this bad stuff's gonna happen if we don't fix the climate. And I knew about that, but it was so detached in my mind because in my mind I was like, well, we're just gonna fix it. Yeah. Like, that's why I'm an activist. Like, we don't have to be scared. Like, oh yeah, that's, that bad thing's gonna happen, but it's not, right? Cause like, we're gonna fix it. We have revolution, great. And then it wasn't yeah. until I think last week when Elizabeth Warren dropped out. I, um, I liked her, she was fine. I didn't support any particular candidate. No. Because politicians are the worst and I hate them all. And so I was like, I will support your policy. I will vote for you over other people. But I'm not going to ever be like, this is my candidate. I was super against that. And so when she dropped out, I was like, oh, man, that really sucks because she had some good climate plans. And then my friend texted me and she said that she started crying in class. And I, at first I was like, oh, that's really hard. Like, I know she really liked Warren. But then I realized, like, she didn't just like Warren. When Warren dropped out and I had that realization, that was when I first understood climate anxiety, fully understood it, because I realized, like, like, I, again, I hate saying one candidate, but now that she's gone, Bernie Sanders is our only hope, our only hope. And I just realized, like, I don't know if he's going to win the election. Mm. And if he doesn't, our emissions are not going to go down. Our environmental protections are going to be destroyed. Like, I just realized that this next election in the U.S. is going to change the course of humanity. And in the yeah. history books, if there even are any, it's either going to say they fixed it and they did good and they kept striking and Bernie was, like, cool and we were, like, cool and we, like, built it up and it was fine. Or they're going to say <laughs> they voted for Joe Biden, they voted for Trump, they voted for whoever, and the world came to an end. And I just, like fully comprehended what that means and so it just yeah now I get worried about it because I, I didn't understand before I thought everything was going to be fine but I recently in the past few weeks realized that everything is not fine and everything is not going to be fine well I think yeah uh, that's really good thanks I think um it's part of the problem, isn't it, that the system is so rigged that you, you have to choose between a few old white guys, basically. It's, it's like, um, it's not really democratic. You know, you've got so many people in your country and um, that you've got such a small choice and it's all based on how much money they spend on the elections. And, and um, even if Bernie gets in, I mean, don't get me wrong, Bernie seems like a good guy and everything, but um, it's no guarantee that, everything is going to suddenly be fine you know so um sure. i really feel for you and everyone in america um 
and yeah everyone in the world because like you said america's like the most powerful and um one of the worst emitters so co2 emitters so um have you heard of a have you heard of a paper called deep adaptation i feel like i've heard of it but i'm not remembering it now yeah it's uh it's quite a hard-hitting report on where we could be going as a species and some people have even suggested it shouldn't really be communicated to young people because it's so shocking um but i'm but i'm personally of the opinion that should that actually people your age should read it and younger because even. nothing's gonna change if we don't know yeah exactly i mean it, it's quite it, it's not the kind of thing that's um it's not fully scientific in the sense that it's not it so it kind of lays out scenarios we might be going into and and kind of makes the case that it's quite possible that we've already passed tipping points that we can't go back from and and it, it it's called deep adaptation because the conclusion of the paper is that we should be really preparing for the worst um in terms of you know like how we organize our communities and how we relate to our families and you know all sorts of things and and it, it's quite hard i mean i've i've cried about it several times i i mean i cry quite easily but um and there's, there's a video i can send you a link to of a 13 year old boy who who read it and then discussed it with his parents and then he went into his school a very privileged school this is like a tiny school on on bali like for international students like in in the in the far east and and then they're all discussing these young teenagers are discussing this this like catastrophic scenario of what we could be going into but i'll, I'll link you to it anyway but it's not necessarily saying that it, nobody knows what's going to happen for sure do you know what i mean so yeah. it's all it's always worth remaining positive and and doing what we can for sure um but i feel like it's my responsibility to share that with people um and i found it interesting reading one of your tweets the other day um you said sometimes i love your honesty that's what one of the things i really love about you and your really comes through in your videos it's like you don't care you're not trying to be you know something you're not or you're not trying to be like the perfect activist. You're just being yourself, which yeah. is like, I, yeah. When I started my channel, I tiptoed around everything. I just tiptoed, tiptoed. I didn't want drama. I didn't want anything. I would get hate comments no matter what I did. And I, would, I feel like every video I made had like a five minute section of it that was just me trying to explain and defend myself. Okay. And so I realized that like, People are going to be mad no matter what you do. Because when I posted that litter pick video that you were talking about, the earth cleanup, where we picked up almost 600 pieces of trash, I got so much hate on that video. Really? Yeah. Isn't that absurd? And I realized that no matter what you do, people are going to be super pissed off. So I just stopped, like, caring. So yeah, that's, yeah, anyways, that's the backstory yeah. on why I say whatever I want on yeah. that. And I know I'm not perfect. That's crazy. But, How can people hate you picking up litter? I mean, they, they must said, have really boring lives, I guess. It's true. And like, people will say, like, at strike, they're like, why don't you go pick up litter and actually help the environment? I'm like, first of all, we just talked about how that doesn't actually help the climate. Mm -hmm. But I, um, and then, of course, when I do that, they're saying picking up litter is not going to help the climate, okay? And I'm like, I literally know that. I can't do anything right for you people. And also people saying, like, oh, you're just doing it for the attention. You should pick up litter even when there's not a camera. And I'm like, I, I, I also do that. I just thought it'd be a fun video. So yeah, like literally people will be mad about anything. So yeah, do what you want. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's like an interesting point because um, obviously like, you know, I think you, you've got a lot of charisma and your, your, your channel's very exciting. You're very colorful videos you obviously use quite is it you who does the editing and puts all the colorful yeah yeah i need to get some tips on you from about that because I'm, <laughs> I'm rubbish at that sort of thing but um yeah there's something about the youth climate movement where it does kind of encourage almost like this minor celebrity kind of um 
but also you anyway you started your own channel anyway so you wanted to platform yourself anyway so that's fine i mean i'm doing the same for myself and i think you know all all, all um, human beings love a bit of um uh you know we, we all need to communicate and have a place in society and get our message across and we all like to be liked and everything so you know people having a go at you for wanting to do something fun or or you know show off your skills or whatever it is 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 sounds like jealousy really but um but yeah do you do you see yourself as a bit of a leader or or well you are i mean you you are a leader you 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 started the i mean what's your idea of leadership and does it make you feel uncomfortable sometimes that you feel like too responsible or are you okay with it I feel like half the time I feel like I don't get enough recognition and then half the time I feel like I get too much recognition. Yeah. Um, it's hard when people don't recognize how hard I work on things and how much I put into things. Hmm. Like I remember the September 20th strike that had 2000 people. I felt like no one cared that I poured my heart and soul into that and that I had been doing, I had been striking before there were cameras around mm. and I had been planning that for months. And obviously it wasn't me. It was a massive team of people. Um, definitely not just me at all. And I probably had a lesser part in it than I thought I did at the time, but I felt like no one knew who I was. No one cared. No one cared about my hard work. Um, but then I, that night, I, well, I spoke at the September 20th strike. And then that night I spoke at a concert um, Glenn Hansard invited me, and he's amazing, and he's Irish, amazing. And a beautiful accent, but, um, and then when I was walking out of that concert, and people were coming up to me on the street, being like, you're so amazing, like, I love you, I love your speech, like, oh, uh, like, going on and on, and I just was like, ah, and yeah. it was freaking me out, and so I do put a lot of work in, and I do think of myself as a leader, because, like, I, um, me and Raquel, who I mentioned earlier, we make the executive decisions because it's our, we started it and we have the resources. Um, and so, yeah, I am a leader and I'm, I'm in charge in a way of just that we, if there is a decision that has to be made, it's going to be me and Raquel that make that. Um, but then at the same time, I do feel like I get too much credit. Um, like when I'm talking and people start clapping, I'm like, why are you clapping? (laughs) And, um, even I went to an event the other night, another screening of that, this is climate change documentary and people that I had never met before, did not know their name, were like, Ari, it's so nice to finally meet you. I've heard so much about you. Like you're so, and I was like, it, it's strange because I just feel like I am a leader technically and I, I know I do a lot, but then when I get that recognition that I, that I crave sometimes when I get it, yeah. I'm just like, this is strange. I don't deserve this. Like, I'm just, I'm, it's fine, but yeah, it's a weird complex. Sure, sure. I understand. I, I've had similar things, I think, myself. Um, do, do you, have you heard the concept of servant leadership before? Mm-mm. Yeah, it's quite nice. Uh, it, it's something I try to remember when I feel like I'm being too egotistical or, um, yeah, it, it, the, the idea of servant leadership is, that the best leaders serve who they're leading so it's like you're responsible for well it, that can actually make you feel more overwhelmed sometimes but sometimes it can be a good grounding thing to to remember that you're you're serving people and it's quite an honor that you can do you know you're in quite a privileged yeah. honored position and and um and you know it's quite fashionable or or it's long been sort of a part of left wing uh, activist movements that there's all that there's a suspicion of hierarchy and and um, that there's a there's a big focus on trying to decentralize decision making and and so yeah. on as as you probably know. But actually, in reality, I think people do like to have leaders in certain situations. So sometimes you're doing the job that other people are sort of too scared to do or or are not you know uh, but also it can be good to encourage other people around you to take on 
leadership roles when they can do you, do you ever do that or yeah um there's a little girl that comes to strike named elise and i i've made her my vice president cool <laughs> so uh if i ever am not at strike i'm like okay elise like you got to be at strike like gotta be there at two because i'm not gonna be there like go, go hold down the floor and yeah it's fun. And while I was gone um, for three months while I was in treatment in the hospital um, for anorexia, that, I mean, my responsibilities were handed over to people, mainly Raquel, but also she obviously couldn't do it all herself. And so it ended up getting handed over to people that I did not know. I had never met them. I've still never met some of them because when I came back, they just left. Um, but yeah, it's been weird to give other people my responsibilities, but at the same time, I found it more freeing than yeah. freaking me out like it used to yeah yeah, that's good sometimes it's just good to let go isn't it and it doesn't you know and, and things that aren't always going to be perfect and if you try and change over between i've found this in activist work um yeah sometimes information gets lost and you just have to accept it. it's like you know yeah um and that that's interesting you well that's good you you raised your um you raised the anorexia thing because it you've been very honest on like really open on your videos about that and you did a whole you did a whole video on um eating disorder recovery and stuff um yeah. and that's great i think you know for other people suffering from the same condition it's you know quite inspiring for them to see someone so openly and courageously you know explaining uh, that stuff um is it is it was that a big decision for you doing that that particular video for instance the recovery video or did you just not really mind about telling people about stuff like that i don't it wasn't i didn't even think about it i just did it and i mean i started my channel because i had these idols on youtube i was never really allowed to watch youtube um and then once i hit like eighth grade I started being allowed to watch YouTube um, without my parents in the room watching what I was watching. So I started watching a lot of videos of bands that I really liked and I was really into, I'm still really into metalcore and screamo and pop yeah. punk and things. And that led me into interviews of those bands by this guy, which led me into other YouTubers. So I got really into these YouTubers and at a time where I had no friends i was being bullied every day worse things than that were happening every day i got kicked out of school um in eighth grade because they said we can't keep you safe so you need to leave oh. um because things were bad and so i just every day would watch these videos of these people that i love and you can't see um from here you can just see i think a couple of posters there mm. but my whole room's covered in posters like it's absurd um and I have posters of like all these people I'm talking about around me right now, like right next to me on my wall. But um, they, when I was, I mean, at that point in my life, obviously you can imagine with the bullying and with everything, with other things going on, was very depressed. I had been to a psych hospital for a week. And at that point I was still very naive. And I thought like, oh, when you're sick, you go to the hospital, then they cure you and then you leave. So when I left and I was still depressed, I did not understand what was happening. Um, and so it was just like a time where it was just hospitalization over hospitalization. I was suicidal. I was self-harming. It was just a disaster. And these YouTubers that I watched, I liked them because they were funny and I liked their content. And I thought they were cool, but they had videos that I would watch um, called, I've tried to kill myself, called, I've had depression, called, like, they would come out and they would talk about it. And it would help me so much. And I actually, actually on one of my, before I started a channel, just on one of my like Gmail account channels, I made a video called Inspirational Johnny Gilbert. And I just went through all these mental health videos that he had and compiled like a little mashup, of all of them. And it's him talking about his experience and it's his, him crying about it. And it's him saying, if you want to self-harm today and you don't, I'm proud of you. And so that was just like the mentality of YouTube for me. And also with my YouTube channel in the past year, it's almost been two years or maybe three years, I think two years since I've started it. Um, people always ask like, how do you come up with your content? And I'm like, whatever I'm doing that day, I'm just gonna film it. Like for example, the other day, I really wanted to make sugar scrub because my skin has been weird. 
So I was like, why not make that a video? So I filmed it and now I'm editing it and it's a video. And so when an eating disorder was a massive part of my life and recovery was my whole life, that's what I'm going to make a video about. And so it was kind of like just a no brainer. I didn't think about it. I wasn't like, should I post this? Should I not post this? I was just like, Hey, this is what I'm doing in my life. And people wanted to know. So I put out a video. That's cool. Um, do you think, so it sounds like watching all the, the videos of these people like Shawnee Gilbert, I don't know who that is, but um, did, do you not, are you not slightly, I mean, sorry, I would be slightly concerned that, that it could perpetuate things a bit. If you're watching stuff like that all the time, it could actually make things a bit worse. I guess it's a fine line. I'm sure it does help as well. Yeah, it's definitely a fine line. And the music I listen to, I think, is also a fine line. And my parents were angry. They did not want me watching that. And I I mainly just watch the fun, funny videos. Mm. But I would also watch those videos just to see what these people that I loved so much and idolized what they had gone through. And for me, and listening to the music that I listen to where people are literally screaming, which I love, but yeah. literally screaming screaming about being suicidal about addiction about like these really hard things about being depressed there's a line and I think that at times in my life I let it perpetuate it because I didn't decide to use that music as a coping skill I just listened to it to wallow in my darkness um whereas most of the time and I think most of the time for most people it is a coping skill and it is helpful um you just have to make sure that when you're listening to that song and why I listen to those kind of music, that kind of music, and like I'm looking at a picture of a guy over there that I have on my wall named Caleb Shomo, all his songs are about addiction and eating disorders are often really related to addiction and they have like a lot of the same components. So when you're in treatment for an eating disorder, you even have 12 step, even though it's not an addiction. And so he writes songs about when he was um, an alcoholic. And for me, when I listen to those songs, I, I love him. I idolize him. I want to meet him. I want to give him a hug just listening to that and knowing that he feels exactly the way that I feel but that he's better now that he's successful that he's Mm. happy that he's living that's what really helps me and you it's it's there's a line where you just need to remember why you're listening to it oh well that sounds good that sounds really positive because yeah I mean actually when I was your age I was really into I don't I don't understand what sorry I'm a bit out of touch I don't really understand what metal core is but I was into metal which is, I guess, not metal core, but um, yeah, they're similar. <laughs> yeah, the, the, and there was a lot of metal which it felt like it was really therapeutic. I was getting a lot of anger and stuff out, and just energy. Um, yeah, but some of it on the extreme edges. I I got into a few bands which were a little bit dodgy, like they were just singing about or screaming about, kind of really wallowing in very dark like Mm -hmm. yeah not not and almost like glorifying sort of horror definitely bands that I listen to less that glorify things I'm like you probably shouldn't say that but it's also kind of a mood so I guess I'll listen to it but don't say that (laughs) yeah yeah but that's cool it sounds like you've got a lot of self-awareness so that's great um oh yeah so music and then I was going to talk a bit about your you're obviously very artistic and um you designed some cool clothes and stuff like that t-shirt with the um the clock the blue and the red line showing yeah the warming stripes yeah i love that that's amazing yeah, that was upcycled that so you just kind of bought an old t-shirt and i already had it actually and i was going to get rid of it because i never wore it and mm. then i was like we're turning this into something new we're keeping yeah. it so I think that that kind of creativity, I think, can really, I think that more more of that in in the climate movement um, from from lots of people, more creativity and and writing and music and to bring more people in, I think, because there's only so much you can do by giving speeches every Friday. Do you know what I mean? I think bringing in like more creativity is is good for everyone. Um, And oh yeah, you're right. Am I right in thinking you're I think it's on your Twitter, yeah, that you're, I don't know if you're still putting together this book. Yeah, I'm still trying to decide what I want to do with it because 
I knew when I started trying to do that, um, that other people were doing it. I don't think I realized the amount of other people that are doing it. Oh, really? I'm actually being interviewed for a book very similar to the one I wanted to do. Um, and so I, I knew that originally doing it, I was probably going to end up not doing it. But I do want to figure out a way to still take what I got in preparation and use it. Um, I was thinking about doing something kind of like the meddling kids movement, uh, which I think I'm being featured on this week, hopefully. So that's cool. But they have a website and a social media where they post about different activists. And I thought maybe I could start a website or start something and start doing that with the stories that I gathered. But I don't think I'm going to put it together as a book anymore, especially because um, the ways that I have the means to put together a book are mainly through Amazon and companies I don't want to engage with. Okay, well, that's very ethical for you. Yeah, sorry, I didn't really explain to the viewers um, that Ari was was thinking of putting together a book about youth youth climate activists around the world, and especially yeah. lesser known ones, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah, but it's a great idea, and I'm sure there are lots of different ways of doing, yeah, like you've just explored a bit, different ways of doing that um yeah um so what else was i going to ask you um yeah do you think there's an do you oh so i've been quite involved with extinction rebellion you know extinction rebellion um, and yeah. so, so uh i'm still involved in the uk um off and on and i really support the general thrust of what they're doing but I sort of maintain a bit of a critique as well because I don't sort of agree with everything. Um, but that's the nature of a movement, I guess. But what do you think? And don't worry if you don't support them. But what do you think of what they do in, in the US? I was obsessed, obsessed with Extinction Rebellion. I wanted, I wanted to make shirts with Extinction Rebellion. I wanted everything in my wardrobe to say Extinction Rebellion on yeah. it. I had my pin that I wore <laughs> every day on my jacket. And if I took my jacket off, I would take the pin off and put it on my shirt. Cool. Like, I was obsessed. I spent hours every day looking at Extinction Rebellion things. I wanted to go get arrested. I went to an XR meeting okay. and signed up. And I was like, arrest me. And then my parents were like, no. Um, <laughs> I, just, I was obsessed. I love them. I love their mentality. I liked what they stood for. I liked what they did. They were nonviolent. They went and did things. They disrupted things. It was when they built that tent city in, I think it was London, yeah. um, during the International Rebellion last fall. Mm. I just was like, yes, this is you created your own city in the city and you yeah. shut it down and you, you, they shut down DC and I was just living for it and obsessed with it. And I wanted to be arrested and I wanted to go do it. And, um, I was, I even was like, let me run your social media in Salt Lake. Like just mm. let me do anything I can. Great. And then the, uh, the train situation happened, um, on, I think it was the London underground. Oh God. Where they I can't jumped believe on top this of the train. had such a big effect. This is crazy. And I was like, okay. And to be honest, from what I saw, they were like, it got violent. I'm pretty sure it didn't get violent. The people like attacked Extinction Rebellion. And then people that didn't like Extinction Rebellion were like, they started beating people up. And I was like, they started getting beat up, is what happened. Yeah. Just from what? So I was annoyed with the bad press on that, but I didn't necessarily, that didn't turn me off from them. Good. And now whenever I see XR actions, I'm like, that's awesome. That's epic. I love that. But I took my pin off because I feel like for every five or 10 great actions that they have, even 20 great actions, there's one that is like a massive screw up that you're just like, why did you let that happen? That gets terrible attention. And so I'm really frustrated because I'm like, I wanted to get arrested for you guys, but you're kind of idiots sometimes. And I think that the way that it's set up where anyone can do anything in the name of XR is great. Yeah. But I think that, I mean, and I know they're trying to restructure and help and change, but it's just like, it got to the point where there's too many things that are just massive F ups. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't want to wear your pin every day if you're still doing all that. So I'm like hoping they'll make a revival, but I don't know if it's going to happen. Well, Oh, poor, poor Mark. Okay, so I know um, 
uh, Mark Ovland. I'm actually going to interview him in a few days, and he's one of the guys who was on the train. So <laughs> he's a nice he's a nice guy. He's a really nice guy. I think that was just a bit of a mistake that action. But we all make mistakes, and I think it's such a shame that it was blown. You know what the media are like. It, it just became it so way out of massive. proportion. Yeah. The media um, hates Extinction Rebellion. It, and if you read their articles, mind you, during that rebellion, there were so many articles about how XR is cutting police. Like, what? You read the article, there's not a single thing about XR hurting police in the entire article. Hmm. Or XR vandalizes this thing. Not a single thing about them. Like, it's just... So what, but tell me what else, when you say they do massive F-ups, what, what else, what, what, what else? Oh. Cramp and yeah. what else? Is the, I feel like the way that they handle things, a lot of it is more the media than XR. But the way that they handle things isn't always the best for media. And I'm like, listen, I agree with you and you're right and I get it. And I agree with being extreme. But sometimes I'm like, I know that you have to be extreme to get your point across. But if you don't take into account what it's going to be viewed as your point is completely lost and i think that happens too much where i'm like guys that was so awesome and i agree with you and i know like like it wasn't too extreme we have to be extreme and i'm like i know you do but you have to be really extreme while making sure you can keep that public view not i mean people are going to hate you no matter what like i said i don't care if half the population hates you but when you're getting so many people that hate you because of the way that the action was perceived it's so frustrating because I'm like, who's your PR person? Like, that was a great action. You have, you're saying great things and we need you to do this. But it, yeah. it just does not work. And like the digging up the lawn, that was one I'm on the fence about. Because again, I'm like, you know what? Why you did that? And they sent out a whole explanation about it. Why you did that was great. Like, I agree with you. What yeah. you were saying, you did that. Everything about it was great. Awesome. But there was not like a single article that was not so negative about that. And I like, I agree again, I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree, but I feel like almost nothing positive came from it. And a lot of that frustration is a lot on the media and the world and how they perceive extinction rebellion. But at the same time, I feel like they need to take that into account. No, I, I do you know what? I do agree with you that the media strategy sometimes leaves something to be desired. I mean, you know, people are trying their best and I can't say too much because I, I should try and step up and do better if I think I can, I guess. But like sometimes I see some of the spokespeople on the on the breakfast shows in the UK and stuff. And I think like, why haven't you just rehearsed some really simple well, sometimes they obviously have, but other times I just think there's some really obvious things you could say which would make it sound really good right now, but you're not saying them. Um yeah. But I reckon, though, I reckon that when you're in a TV studio, it's, it's probably quite, like, frightening for some people, and they probably freeze a bit. I mean, maybe yeah. I would freeze. I don't know. But um, Yeah, I feel like yeah. with the spokespeople, sometimes I'm like, why did you do that? Why did mm. you say that? Like, <laughs> yeah. like, you could have fixed everything and you made it worse. So, yeah, it's just frustrating. Parts but you it. could, but you could, I mean, especially... Uh, I mean, it'll be a bit easier for you when you turn 18, I guess, or uh, actually, I don't know how the law is. I know in some American states, the kind of full rights of being an adult are 21 and not 18, but like, in terms of getting arrested and stuff like that, um, anyway, I should be really careful what I say because your parents <laughs> won't, might, won't be happy with me, <laughs> but uh, uh, forget getting arrested, um, but doing, so, doing social media, like if if you see that it's being done badly, you can, you can step up and say, you know, I, I think if you say it nicely, I think you could be doing this better or do you want help with social media or whatever? And maybe you could help. Is there an Extinction Rebellion in Utah? Um, there is an Extinction Rebellion in Salt Lake and they've okay. been taking a hiatus for an extremely long time. Right. And I obviously can't say anything about what they're planning or not planning, but it's not much. <laughs> Um, and on one hand, I feel like it leaves something to be desired. And I'm like, come on, guys, go shut down the city. But yeah. on the other hand, I'm like, just don't do anything because I don't want to deal with another controversy. 
You don't want to do what, sorry? I don't want to deal with another controversy. So I'm kind of just like, do whatever you want. Yeah. And hopefully I support it. <laughs> okay. But it's nice, yeah, it's nice that you, uh, well, I, th- I mean, I guess I thought you would sort of generally support Extinction Rebellion. I thought you would. Um, uh, can I ask you, I don't know, have we been, how long have we been talking? Quite a while. Let um, me look. 50 minutes. Okay. Um, are, you, are you okay just for a few minutes more? Yeah. Cool. Um, can I ask you something about, uh, so I'm building a, 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 an online resource for activists. It, it, I'm collecting together lots of uh, already existing websites and kind of curating them into lists and adding notes and strategy notes and things like that. Um, it's kind of, a, it's, a, it's semi-commercial, so I will be charging some people for it, but I also hope to give a lot of it away for free. Um, but it's a way that I can make a living, but also help people, you know. Um, but hopefully, eventually, it will all be for free. I can make money in another way, like maybe YouTube channel or something. But I just wanted to ask you, in your perfect online resource for activists, is there, is there ever any information that you've searched for online and you've thought, don't worry if the answer's no, but is there any information that you've searched for and you've thought, why, aren't, why can't I find this information? Or it'd be really useful if somebody did a website like this. It would really help activists or help youth activists. Or, um, or if you can't think of it now, it's something maybe you could write to me afterwards. Um, yeah, it's, been, it's frustrating when you hear things and you believe them. And then when someone's like, well, where's your proof? And you look it up. You can't find proof without reading hundreds of pages of scientific things and then explaining how to interpret them yeah. how into the proof that you need. Like it's if you have a question about I don't know, World War Two, you're just like, I have an Alexa over here, so I'll say, Hey Google. Say like, Hey Google, and you ask the question and then it just tells you. Whereas with climate change, um, I've been told many times and from what I've seen, um, these people say the world warms and cools that's what it does and I'm like you're right you're just uneducated also because you're wrong um and and so what I've been told and from reliable sources is that you know if this is the war the world warming cooling warming cooling that we should be about here we should be starting to cool whereas instead we are just doing this and it's like not good to just break out of that cycle but when I try to find that, I, I don't have the time to read through no. all the like data to figure out and then explain that to someone who doesn't even believe me in the first place. And so just stuff like that, like it's hard to just get an answer to a question fast. Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll try and work on that because that's really tricky because climate science is so complex, isn't it? Um, but I have put together a list of over 90 uh, websites which are purely focused on climate science but um you would still have to really search those websites to so maybe i need to try and draw draw out essential information more for people so so that it's like really accessible i don't know um it's a tricky one yeah thanks for that um well all my questions are used up but if you if there's anything um, else that you want to talk about or communicate to uh, other youth activists in the UK or um, if there's anything that's on your mind about activism that we haven't talked about, um, I don't know. Um, Nothing really except for um, I've recently changed the information in my bios on social media, but what it used to say was, if you truly believe in the words that you preach, get off your screens and out to the streets. That's cool. So if you really care, then get off of Twitter. I love Twitter. My Twitter account got deactivated, so I hate Twitter right now, actually. I was just getting almost 2,000 followers. Greta followed me, and then Twitter was like, screw you. But anyways, we're working on that. Yeah. But um, 
get off Twitter, get off Instagram. I hate to tell you, but sharing a like a post from like ecofeminist.2020 on your story isn't activism. It's barely even spreading awareness. Like I, I know that's so like rude to say that almost, but it's another thing where it's an illusion of thinking you're doing something when in reality you're not. And we need everyone to be doing something. I was going to say everyone out on the streets, but when coronavirus is not a global pandemic, we need you out on the streets. But until then, I mean, we'll have to do some things through our screens, but for real, like, I'll, and I'll give you a bunch of things to link in the description yeah, and all that you yeah, can get yeah. involved with, but like, just get out and do it. Stop giving yourself excuses. I've had to learn that I'm never going to do it tomorrow. I can't say I'll do that tomorrow. You're not going to do it tomorrow. You're just not. Do it right now. Do it today. Like, get off your phone this second when this is over and go do it. Like, just start. Just start. Don't be afraid. I want to start a strike, but I don't, I think I'll be alone. Greta was alone. Raquel was alone. I would thought I would be alone. Just do it. Like, just go and do it. Like, just, just do something. <laughs> I'm taking this quite personally, actually, because <laughs> I've been spending too much time on the computer and too much time on Twitter and stuff. But I think it's, it, it's, that's fantastic way to end but I just would like to say that I'm just to try and defend myself um <laughs> I think it is good to use these platforms if you're getting out on the streets as well like yeah you know complimenting but yeah well and um, you've been working on your website and you're you know compiling those things and so you you've been doing more than just like retweeting people yeah you know yeah thanks thanks um and yeah, it'd be great to maybe catch up in a, in a, in a few months or something and see, see where you're at, if you're up for that, like to do another yeah. one of these. That'd yeah, be really awesome. Sure. And oh, by the way, do you know that uh, really interesting woman who has a far more developed YouTube channel than I do called Gail Kimball is after you for an interview? Anyway, her interviews are really cool. So um Good luck with that. And um, I guess I'll see you on Twitter. Yes, I'll see you on Twitter, hopefully on my main account soon. Yeah, not my... yeah good luck with that. <laughs> good luck with that. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, take care. All yeah. right, bye.